I don't know about you, but one of the first things I do when entering someone's house is look at their bookshelves. And if they don't have bookshelves, I'm like, why am I here? No, I'm a nice person. I talk to non-readers. I'm not prejudiced like that. However, this is my friends, and I've organized her bookshelves. I know what her shelves look like, but I've never had time to look through her 3,000-page Norden anthology because look at this glorious beauty. And this is my YouTube channel. Here, we are very professional. The guests are me, myself, my lamp, and my desk that I sit on. One of these cool things that I'm going to do in my life is start reading more because I love reading. I decided to just be able to ramble on about things and pretend like people are listening to me. It's going to be really great. And her job is to hunt demons. That's what I wanted for my 16th birthday. I should be an English teacher. I want to like take this book and present it to a class. What's morality? What is the meaning of life? Everyone here is like, I'm here for the YA literature. Hey Buttercup. I've been plotting your murder since before I met you. Of course I didn't finish Eddie on my TBR because if you finish them on your TBR, like, what kind of person are you? I'm still kind of horrified about the whole horror part. It makes me a lot less rambly and you're like, this is less rambly. How could you be more rambly than me? It's still there, my own heart, cobbled together and a little worse for wear. But it's definitely not all beat out. I'm just doing a little bit of a life update. So I can't really stand up or do anything. Like even talking here, I'm getting a little bit of shortness of breath. I don't know when I'm going to come back and post videos. I'm hoping it's going to get a lot easier <laughs> to do life very soon. Nancy from Every Heart of Doorway. This is my little ace girl. I'm just a Greek myth nerd and, you know, other people have lives. It goes in, it tells a story, and then it completes the story. And I think that's so beautiful because the characters don't just disappear with no explanation of what happened to the rest of their lives. And it's such a beautiful incorporation of myths. I love this cover. I love just the... Th the beautiful name, the world we found. Maybe it's just because I'm finishing up my own college days and I'm looking forward to the future and I'm looking at the friends and I'm thinking about the person I was now and the person I was in late high school and the person I was 10 years ago, which is just weird that I can say 10 years ago and I'm thinking about the world I found and a world I didn't necessarily think I would have found 10 years ago or five years ago or maybe even a few years ago when I started college. I'm going to be vlogging. I'm very, very good at things like this. And I never feel awkward just talking to myself, especially in public, worrying that people are going to come and watch me. Because this is the fourth year I'm going to be running at the Writer's Society at my school. You deplore the demonstrations that are presently taking place in Birmingham, but I am sorry that your statement did not express a similar concern for the conditions that brought the demonstration into being. I gave that five stars, like, Everything I've read by him so far is delightful and wonderful. Some say the world will end in fire. Some say in ice. From what I've tasted of desire, I hold with those who favor fire. But if it had to perish twice, I think I know enough of hate to know that for destruction, ice is also great. His social commentary, his word, his choices is just... Brilliance incarnate, and I love it so much. She is visiting me from Germany, which is super, super exciting, because we decided that we were going to film things, but because we disagree on pretty much every bookish opinion ever, we decided that we were just going to talk about couples, and then we could debate it. Gilbert Blythe from Anne of Green Gables, my favorite hero <laughs> of all time. <laughs> so, no, no pressure. So, so... <laughs> I don't have a Gilbert mannequin. No! Oh, no! Him no. no! No! That's incest! I, I don't like the Shadowhunters novels, but she loves them. Which one does Voldemort deserve to be with? Nobody! Who does Tom Riddle deserve to be with? This cup says, There's a million books I haven't read yet, but just you wait, which is a Hamilton reference and a Christmas present, so that makes me really happy. When, when, she, when she says she talks a lot, she really talks. <laughs> Wishes were horses, even beggars would ride. He's also like the smart guy who loves history texts, which is really hot. That line to Lila, we could sit here and I could read history to you, is just like, goals. Goals, please. In the beginning of January, I got news that my health issues weren't going to get better, that I have a chronic illness and I will be living the rest of my life with the amount of pain that I injure right now, which was definitely something that was hard-hitting and you're not supposed 
to be in college and have to deal with pain for the rest of your life. And it's something that I've had to adjust to and come to terms with how my future and my dreams and aspirations are going to work while having a chronic illness. And today I am going to be doing the drunk book tag. I'm not drunk, but I'm going to pretend like I'm really drunk because that's kind of the point of it. You don't have to be drunk to take it. Anyways, this is my two year anniversary of being on booktube and I wanted to celebrate it by doing a lot of the basic tags that have been around since I started and I've just never managed to do. I am drinking... it looks like a smoothie. It has alcohol in it. Here, just tastes like it's liquid bread and I don't get the appeal. Although I did like it once mixed with coffee, but that was mostly because it tasted like coffee. And when there is sex in books, I'm just kind of like, can we move along now? Move along like I know you can. Hi, Sam Sunny is amazing if you watch my previous vlog. A lot of it is just me reading sections of it because he's so sassy and satirical and lovely and just intelligent and so much. I have so much respect and appreciation for the man. It's a very political novel that talks about a lot of things that, frankly, I'm not completely aware of everything in here. And yet he makes it very approachable. There's some important lessons you need to know when you're making tea, okay? First of all, one bag is never enough. That is always too little chai. You need some nice, nice, thick, thick, beautiful chai. Secondly, you always, always need just the full bottle of maple syrup. 22 and Taylor Swift shall reign now my life. When it's nighttime, but you're trying to take a thumbnail without the light, and you're just like, how can I put this not in screen? If you have ever wondered what it looks like when I film, yeah, this is what it looks like when I film. <laughs> yeah, you just told me you're weird, but you're still referring to the book as a she and talking as if she's a human being. I was like, darling, I will see you soon. I'm in the middle of Little Fires Everywhere by Celeste Ng, and it's so good. I don't really read a lot of contemporary adult work, but it is fantastic and lovely and amazing and because of my pain I have trouble walking because of my pain I have trouble sitting up because of my pain I have trouble doing daily things like showering or cooking or walking walking is a big thing for me because of the pain and weakness I feel every single day someone pats me on the shoulder and says but you're a healthy young thing and grieving the parts of your life that you aren't going to happen because you're not going to get better and I'm like okay and then they're like okay and I'm like, do you want me to give you the feel of spiel? Because I don't really want to feel whiny today. Or they're like, you feel better. And I'm like, did I mention where I said it's incurable? So do I make a smart joke or do I just nod and... Happy to November, I'm starting NaNoWriMo. The Green Goblin is here and the first thing it warns you to know is don't be deceived by his cute looks because he's sinister. The Wicked King by Holly Black. This is the second book in The Folk of the Air. I read all three this year and I have to apologize because I had to kind of reserve my own judgment because Fae books. I was like, I'm not gonna like those because sometimes misogyny is so ingrained even in females. I love the fact that it has a lot of world building and really fantastic family dynamics. I love that we're given characters, especially female characters, who are allowed to be really, really strong, but it's not physical. We have this misconception that characters, in order to prove that they are strong, have to kind of take on traditional masculine things, which is just sexism kind of hidden, and I love that she's able to be strong and powerful in herself, 
even when she's scared and even when she's afraid and even when she's not physically able. I love the line, and Gansey ran with dead Welsh king. Before booktube, before many things, there was one unbridled truth, and that was my love from Marissa Meyer. There is a beautiful quote that I love that says, we are all bound up in the people we love, the people who make us who we are. So who am I without them? Welcome to the first reading vlog of 2020. I'm going to be talking about the books that I'm reading and so on. You know the drill. The first book that I'm going to be reading on this vlog happens to be Homegoing. I don't know the last time I cried that much during a movie. I just wept the whole time. Oh my goodness. I need to decompress my thoughts from this movie. It was so freaking well done. Okay, I'm not gonna read the introduction or the about this. Is this Frankenstein? <laughs> no! <laughs> A very good book that not enough people have read. True. It's very good. Demon, demon. My initial thought was Shadowhunters, but like I haven't read them. Um, oh, you haven't? I went outside for two reasons. First of all, no shawarma. Second of all, books. This is April 3rd and it's also my last full day in this apartment. This apartment, this room, and I am a little bit sentimental about it. I have moved, I think, six times in the last two years. I am listening to Becoming by Michelle Obama and I am very emotionally attached to it. I'm also just moved by it and impacted by it. I think that it is incredible. I've had like choked up crying out of emotions of grief and miscarriage and racism it reveals a lot of me that i think this is just really sexy so i am five boxes and i still have so many to go sometimes in the darkest moments you look and ask why why do you collect textbooks for classes you will never take i am just spellbound by every word that she weaves the way that she really does sentences with every wit I love Emma. She's probably one of the characters I relate most to in all of fiction. I was really impressed by the conversations, especially about mental health. I really enjoyed the character development. I'm really, really angry that it constantly gets just thrown off as not an important story because Katniss is just focused so much on like figuring out which boy is best for her, which is fine. Don't like crap on girls for wanting romance, but also like that's not Katniss. Like literally it's about a story for survival. Like all she's ever asking is like, I am terrified of love because I'm terrified about like procreating and making my children go through this again. And I think that that's like such a more nuanced conversation to have, but because it's a female main character and female author, they're like, yep, it's about romance. And this is a biography of Cleopatra and kind of debunking a lot of the ways that we look at Cleopatra historically and trying to look more closely at her, especially from a modern view and a feminist view. And I'm really, really excited. I'm reading this with Care of the Wild book garden and she's awesome and also she's one of my favorite people to talk about books, to talk about history, to talk about ideas and philosophy and the way that we look at worlds and I always have great conversations with her so this is going to be great. Among the most famous women to have lived, Cleopatra VII ruled Egypt for 22 years. She lost a kingdom once, regained it, nearly lost it again, amassed an empire, lost it all. A goddess as a child, a queen at 18, a celebrity soon thereafter. She was an object of speculation and veneration gossip and legend even in her own time. At the height of her power, she controlled virtually the entire eastern Mediterranean coast, the last great kingdom of Egypt. Catastrophe reliably cements a reputation, and Cleopatra's end was sudden and sensational. She has lodged herself in her imaginations ever since. Many people have spoken for her, including the greatest playwrights and poets. We have been putting words in her mouth for 2,000 years. Like, I have a lot of underlines already. But one line that really struck me is, a Roman could not pry apart the exotic and the erotic. So often when we talk about women, rather than fear, we use eroticism. A Roman historian was perfectly happy to write off a Judean queen as a mere figurehead and six pages later to condemn her for a reckless ambitious ambition, her an indecent embrace of authority. There was things that kept me from reading on the first four days. Could have been chemical waste, it could have been personal tragedy, probably parents, siblings, wife, husband, daughter I didn't know about. Mm, all great options. You know, I have been reading comic books. Did I plan on reading any comic books? No. Have I read any comic books in recent times? I read Harleen, which was really, really good. I love his realistic and his really good use of art. I used to always say, like, I read everything but romance and horror and now I read both. Put it under a fictional a translator and a fictional original writer and it was loved and it became a bestseller so then a year later he reprinted it. 
he put his own name attached and suddenly the credits panned it. They went from saying it was extraordinary to the fact that it was now terrible because they no longer thought it was ancient. It is brilliantly written and funny and it really shows a lot of the like the stones on which horror was written. So I'm trying to talk about Sula in which this is a book by Toni Morrison that I read previously and did not like at all. The writing is brilliantly done, the characters are open, it shows many of the points of view, how we don't see each other fully, and yeah, I don't think it will ever be my favorite book, but I realized that, you know, I need to come back to books that I didn't like. It's eerie and atmospheric and like whimsy and also super, super funny. If you could put everything I love in a story, it would probably be The Vanishing Half. I you know, it. when we're talking about attractive comic book people, there is chest hair, and then there is that chest hair. I don't know if I have words right now. My Dark Vanessa is a brilliant novel. Russell writes in a way that shows that this is clearly wrong when also allowing Vanessa's romanticized views and misconceptions. This one is very interesting because this is Frida Kahlo, but to me, she's almost unrecognizable because I'm so used to her self-portraits that so often we see her like from the front and that's how I recognize her so strongly so poignantly in the middle that when I see her not focused that somehow my brain almost doesn't think that it's Frida Kahlo and I don't know I I see a lot and of encouragement from her and the way that she depicts pain and the way that she talks about disability. I read Homecoming in January and I fell completely in love. <laughs> I finished Jane Eyre and I have a whole lot of thoughts. I really, really liked the first half and the second half was hard. It started at Northender Abbey, which is Jane Eyre's first written and a satirical pick on gothic novels and it is hilarious. Like, it begins with no one who had ever seen Catherine Morland in her infancy would have supposed her born to be a heroine. We're exploring the same kind of topic with the same kind of trauma, but in a very, very different way. And I really, really like that. I like that these books, literary fiction and horror graphic novel, can be exploring the same time of trauma in two different mediums and so well, but so differently. I went at her with a litany of how could you, how would you, how dare you do this to me. I was out there doing for my family, doing for our community, and she was going to take the girls and leave. When I finished going off, Lynn calmly asked how long I had been sitting at home before I even noticed the three of them were gone. I hadn't noticed until she called. I changed my tact. I set aside my anger, and I tried to explain that there were things I was dealing with that took me away from the home as a man, but never as a husband or a father. I had been a secretive, even deceitful, but not unfaithful. Never unfaithful. What I kept private, I kept private for her sake. I couldn't in good conscience ask her to shoulder what I had been burdened with. Then Lynn told me that she knew I was black lightning. A wig and a mask couldn't disguise her own husband. She told me that she had waited for years for me to be honest with her and to lean on her and to give her the opportunity to uphold her vows instead of marginalizing her day by day. But I had chosen to fight alone. Lynn told me that all she was doing was honoring my wishes. Frances Ellen Watkins Harper was born in 1825 as a free woman in the North, and she became the first woman of Black ancestry to publish in the United States. I want to read her whole collection, and I was so sad that my library doesn't have it, the bookstore doesn't have it, which, you know, in the biography it talks about specifically how they want to talk about her because a lot of women of color were erased from narratives and aren't talked about in canon despite the fact that they had really good poetry and continue to have really good poetry. So I wanted to read a selection from her because I think that this is the best way to do it and it's called The Bible's Defense of Slavery. Bring not to God's majestic throne a mockery of praise, a reverent man whose light should be the guide of age and youth, brings to the shrine of slavery the sacrifice of truth. Like she's just fire and she also has one about writing and like reading and how like education is kept from people who are oppressed in order to keep them oppressed and actually knowing the truth and yeah she is a poet I think that everyone should read even if you don't like poetry like that is beautiful and political and important and all of those things. Then we have Elizabeth Barrett Browning and we talk about in the biography about the fact that you know we often underhype how important she is because of the fact that a lot of women after were much more revolutionary. The idea of a woman taking charge and actually declaring her love is revolutionary. Like saying that I'm not gonna step down from my sincerity because you're gonna mock me and I love that. Let us read today Emily Bronte's Withering Heights chapter 1 page 2. And what did I do? I confess it with shame, shrunk icily into myself. Snail. <laughs> At every glance, retired, 
colder and further into myself. Till finally the poor creature, innocent, was led to doubt her senses. So first of all, this is a quiet, character-focused story that nothing dramatic happens. Like, there are elements that happen that are dramatic, but all of them are subdued to the point that they may as well not be dramatic. And I really enjoyed this, and I think that this is an element why it might not be well-received, but I think that it is really important. This is a story also in which the characters never fully acknowledge their heart, nor do they fully acknowledge their faults. And it really feels like an everyday piece of work that does not focus on a big plot line, but really following these characters in an intimate way. The other aspect that was very quiet that I really appreciated was Liam and his mental health. His mental health is never represented, and I think this is very important and evident for a man in the 1970s. I think mental health was definitely not represented now, and it's something that is still very hard, especially for men to deal with often because of toxic masculinity and the way that we approach therapy. I started making lists when I was about 19, including a lot of like fodder because I was like very embarrassed about the fact that I had not read very much. Pretty much my backstory is I have dyslexia. I did not really learn to read until my teens. And at that point, reading classics was very hard. So I like lived pretty much on Wikipedia and like Spark Notes. And I like knew everything about classics because I like cared about classics, but I couldn't read them. The most interesting book for me was really the last book. And this was The Sun Also Rises which when I saw it, my immediate thought was, well, maybe I'll read that in 10 years. And this seems like an odd thing to be mesmerized by, but like, I remember being that 20 year old kid. I remember being so obsessed with finishing books and being well read and to seem kind of smart or accomplished or all of those things. And I also felt the like huge urgency of it. And to look at a book that is so classic and to be like, yeah, maybe I'll read that at 35 makes me so proud of myself. Maybe it's just like a very internal thing, but it really shows for me that like I've stopped being so obsessed with how people like view me or how I view myself or the need to consume in order to feel educated rather than to consume to enjoy. And that's something that has definitely shifted over the last four years. And I'm just, yeah, I'm proud of myself. I'm happy. This is a picture book that is aimed for young children. It has this really evocative art and it has this really beautiful writing that transcends simplicity to tell a deeper story that hit me. There's this kind of chorus of you know, you hold me up when you share with me, you hold me up, you know, when you play with me and all of these things that are so common in children. And the, the last one of that kind of repetition is you hold me up when you respect me. And that's something that I think that we often deny children. We kind of pretend as if children should only respect adults. And, you know, that's a kind of respect that is a respect of authority, not a respect of person and of humanity, of not othering or bullying. And I think that that's so so important for children to recognize, to recognize the humanity of others and that respect and respect for culture and respect for, you know, autonomy and humanity and all of those. And to, to you know, that, that's a lesson that's hard, but children are much more intelligent than we give them credit for. And get to this, harness the power of evil children. Which, you know, I guess harnessing the power of sexism and assumptions about women was a little bit too dark for Andy Weir. It was compared to Emily Dickinson and a Victorian classic, and I understand why. It feels very timeless in the way that it's constructed. It reminded me a little bit of the yellow wallpaper where, you know, she wants to write and she wants to do all of these things. And she's talking about how she calls it her study, but her husband calls her its sitting room. And how it's not that he just doesn't believe that women can write. He believes that she can't write. And that just hit me. Yoko Ono sits on a stage as the audience members take scissors and slowly cut pieces off her clothes until she is bare. They change from voyeuristics to victimizers as they participate in undressing her as she remains impassive. It is chilling. Though Ono herself never claimed for it to be a feminist work, or one devoting violence against women, the imagery is hard to ignore. Cut piece found its origin in the Fluxus movement, where the idea that art and life were not separate endeavors, but they were indivisible from life and from each other. So Ono's intentions and interpretations of world peace and the give and take of art and of shared identity can also coexist with the personification of sexual violence, eroticism, and the scrutinization of women. Its premiere not only cemented Walt Disney and his company on the world stage, it of course did it in the box office as well. But far from the Hollywood lights, my grandmother Marjorie had just turned six in the dusk of a snowy berry evening. As she grew up, she would clean houses and babysit and scrounge her money to see a show on Saturdays, costing a dime a night. She would go through father's and find herself 14 and working full time to support her mother and brothers. Looking at Elma, I could see her pain, the consistent pressure to hold on to the miracle that has been delivered. And I can hear a small echo 
of my grandmother holding my grandpa's hand and saying, we did all right, didn't we? That I had to see Snow White, a princess obsessed with cleaning and shuffled to the side of her own story for the shenanigans of the comic relief to fully understand the context my grandmother grew up in. As I weep to the soundtrack of Encanto, overjoyed at the diversity allowed and deconstructed, I will look more fondly at Snow White and at my grandmother's. For their strength allowed another strength to be built upon, one less afraid of loss for what they have carried. We wicked snow roll.